The Catholic bishops met in Maynooth over the last few days for their quarterly meeting and uh, this afternoon three of the bishops gave a press conference. Let me tell you a bit about the background to that. It was the first press conference given by bishops since meeting, the meeting in Rome four weeks ago with the Pope. Last week we proposed a special program with the bishops to talk about the Vatican meeting and the statement issued subsequent uh, to that Vatican meeting. We submitted a list of 26 questions which we would like to put to the bishops and the request was refused but we were told that we were free to attend the press conference. We said we would and we would ask the questions that we had submitted at the press conference. Um, the, uh, when we uh, first of all, I should tell you that today we were given just two hours uh, notice of the press conference and it then transpired that the press conference uh, would be attended by neither the Cardinal Archbishop of Armagh, Sean Brady, nor the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, but by three relatively unknown bishops, Dennis Brennan of France, John McAreevy of Dromore and Christopher Jones of Elfin. We were further informed that the press conference would be restricted to just 25 minutes uh, because we were told the conference of bishops was still in session and the bishops, the three bishops who were giving the press conference would return, return to the confer conference of bishops. Now we're going to play you some excerpts from the press conference today. But before we get there, um, just to say that we're joined in studio tonight by Patsy McGarry of the Irish Times, who is also at the press conference, and Mary Raftery, whose uh, television documentaries on clerical child sexual abuse opened up the whole scandal here in Ireland. If you'd like to text us a comment on the program, text the number 53131 and place the word tonight before your comment, or email us at tonight at tv3.ie. A live blog has been run on the program on the website uh, politico.ie. We go now to excerpts from the press conference and we start with an opening statement made by the Bishop of Dromore, John McAreevy, uh, and he's referring to a statement made by a Vatican press spokesman. Sorry about all this, but bear with me. He's referring to a statement made by a Vatican press spokesman yesterday, Jesuit priest Federico uh, Lombardi who uh, denied that the Vatican had ever insisted on secrecy concerning clerical sex abuse. There's a reference to uh, a press release from the Vatican press office yesterday from Father Lombardi um, dealing with an issue uh, which has come up quite a lot over the, in recent, uh, well, recent months but in the last few years. Uh, it's this uh, idea, or this, uh, uh, in, the, in the 2001 norms uh, with regard to the church's management of what were called more serious uh, crimes or grave crimes. Uh, there was a reference there to uh, a pontifical secret, and that has been widely misinterpreted as uh, an attempt by the church to keep these matters purely within a church sphere. And uh, the, um, w we, we made this point, obviously, uh, at the recent uh, uh, visit to Rome, and I'm not sure if that's the reason for this clarification, but the, the clarification here from the Vatican uh, is to the effect that the, inter the, the internal church norms with regard to how these matters are dealt with, uh, as we've said there in the statement, in no way, in no way precludes church authorities from carrying out their civil obligations in regard to reporting and cooperating fully with the civil authorities in relation to any offences uh, involving children. Uh, this is one of those um, kind of canards that uh, just keeps keeps emerging, you know, as if it were a self-evident fa fact. But obviously, Rome is aware of this uh, misinterpretation and the the harm that this obviously does or could potentially do to the the trust that people might have in how the church deals with these matters. And so, uh, I have to say that as a conference, we appreciate hugely the fact that the the Holy See, in addition to statements that we ourselves have made over recent months, uh, makes it clear that uh, there is no uh, endorsement for a culture or a justification for uh, a culture of uh, non-cooperation with the state in regard to these matters. You are responding to uh, a comment by the German Justice Minister yesterday who cited this document as basically uh, a, a, an indication of a wall of silence when yeah. the is concerned. Can we just be clear what happened there? There were two letters that happened both in Latin, by Harvey Matthew, one directing that all credible cases of clerical child sex abuse be referred to him, he would decide, and the congregation would decide, whether those cases would be dealt with in Rome by him or the congregation, or dealt with locally by the bishop. 
and was accompanied by a second letter in Latin also, <coughs> excuse me, asking that this be kept quiet. There was no reference to civil authorities at all. Now, if people are concerned by it, I said to all bishops around the world, including yourself, I take it. I mean, the bishops naturally were asked to keep quiet, so their natural reaction was to do nothing else. So there was no reference to civil authorities in either letter. So people didn't, uh, didn't act on uh, act on that and didn't necessarily go to civil authorities. Indeed, it, it is from the Murphy report we know that this diocese, rather the Archdiocese of Dublin, it didn't even send all the incredible cases uh, as testified by uh, Monsignor John Bowen to Rome itself. Never mind the civil authorities. But I mean, there was no reference in that letter, those two letters, to civil authorities. But there was an injunction to silence. Well, uh, the Irish bishops in the famous the Green Book of 1996 made it clear that they, they, they took on themselves uh, an obligation to report, and they never changed from that. Now, okay, there is an issue about the status of the Green document, but... Mr. John, this is yeah. a further issue. Murphy found that that document was widely drawn. Yeah. It wasn't that part of the described it at the end of 1996 in a conversation of Marion Collins, literally 11 months after it was introduced as simply guidelines, but no uh, power in Canada. Well, the... the uh, I, uh, my, own, my own belief now is that, by and large, it, the, the Green Book policy in regard to reporting what, you know, was observed. There, there were some instances, and you, you quote them, uh, but certainly the, the Roman document was not taken at that time by, can, by, by canonists as somehow countermanding the policy of the Irish bishops from 1996. And now the Holy See is making it clear. I mean, I, I take your point. I mean, it was open to misunderstanding, but I don't think that canonists at that time uh, understood this to be a, um, a ban or a discouragement of cooperation with the civil authorities. Uh, and that's, there was I, no I, encouragement to cooperate with civil authorities. Uh, the, Irish, the Irish bishops and the Americans and, and in other jurisdictions where these matters were being dealt with and where there was a policy clear policy of uh, reporting to the civil authorities, nobody said, now we better stop that. In the course of your meeting with the, uh, with the Pope, did the bishops express the concern of the possibility of the Vatican's complicity in the cover-up of clerical child sex abuse? In the, in the meeting with the Pope and the, um, his advisers, um, there were a whole range of views obviously expressed. And one, one of the, one of the uh, uh, difficulties I think that bishops expressed was the fact that from, at, at times it wasn't always possible to get a clear, uh, clear guidance from the Holy See and, and the, there wasn't always a consistent approach within the different you know, uh, Vatican uh, departments. So uh, to that extent, uh, I think bishops um, and bishops, bishops have said this over the years, that, that it, the Vatican could have, could have been more clear in some of its guidance and more, more consistent. And to that extent, we were obviously asking for uh, the, the, the law that, that has been uh, produced in recent years, even though it has given, given rise to uh, misunderstandings that we're now actually to try and clarify. Uh, by and large, it has been helpful. And, uh, no, my question was, yes. did you raise the concerns about the Vatican, the possibility of the Vatican's complicity in the cover-up of clerical child abuse? Was that raised by the bishops? I think in, 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 those, in the terms in which you put it, I don't think that, that point was made as I say, in those terms. But we were... Uh, the, the thing that struck me most about the... And, I, and my colleagues can speak for themselves about this, was that... Uh, the, the Vatican was not being defensive about the, the handling of the whole matter. It was anxious to, that we would deal with our responsibilities the bishops and raise they would issue, deal with theirs. Did they not? I take it they didn't. Uh, can I just go on and ask a, a separate question related to this? I'm thinking particularly about the Vatican's decision to promote Desmond Connell to the position of Cardinal in, 2000, in the year 2000, knowing that in the year 1996, he had covered up the uh, clerical child sex abuse of Andrew Madden by Ivan Payne, and that he had used the Austin funds to compensate Ivan Payne, and that he had lied about the use of the Austin funds. Did anybody raise the question then about the promotion of Desmond Connell in circumstances where it was known he had engaged in these practices? Uh, that point was not publicly made uh, uh, in the meeting. Are you inferring that it was privately made? Well, if it was, I wouldn't know. 
Could, could I just say, with all this em emphasis on cover-up, you know, the cover-up has gone on for centuries, not just in the church, in the whole of society. It's going on today in families, in communities, in society. Why are you singling out the church? Because yeah. no, there's no other instance where an institution uh, collectively covered up uh, the sexual abuse of children. It's certainly individuals did so, but there's no other instance. Evidence of an institution. What about the family institution, so? Vincent? The family institution, right out there today oh, in community. Come off it. We're come talking on. about an institution such as the church or the state or whatever. Right? There is no other instance of an institution uh, uh, conspiring we know, together to we know that conspiring to cover up the We know that sexual five percent of abuse out there is in families, communities, and other institutions. So and it's all cover up, Vincent. Well, it's, not it's all cover up. It's all <laughs> cover up. No one wants to admit in a family that there's a problem of that nature. No one wants to admit in a club that there's a family. And, you know, I, I'm, not, saying, I'm not justifying are equating, it. Are you equating, what, uh, are you equating the embarrassment of in, in, in the, an individual family about sexual abuse with the cover-up of the institution of the Catholic Church, uh, uh, ranging from priests to bishops to the Vatican itself, the entire institution engaging in a, a persistent cover-up of the ab sexual abuse I of children. I totally reject that. Well, they, I'm sorry, uh, which, which I, bit do you, which you, you could, could I ask you, just, what bit do you object to? What bit do you object to? Can I add one point? Could I just ask Christopher Jones? Can I add one point? No, could I just ask Christopher Jones, what do you object to? I object to Sorry, what do you... I object to the way the church is being isolated and the focus on the church. We know, and we've made mistakes. Of course we've made mistakes. But why this huge isolation of the church, and this huge focus on cover-up in the church, when it has gone on for centuries. I mean, it's only now, for the first time ever, that victims have been given a voice to, to, to publicly express their, their pain and their suffering. And before that, for centuries, no one spoke. You know, Freud said that venereal disease among children was, 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 um, was because of sexual abuse. He had to withdraw it. He had to withdraw it. That's the kind of cover-up that has gone on for centuries. Did the bishop talk about the victims? Did I the think you're unfair and unjust okay. to the church. Did, uh, talk no. about the victims. Did the bishops, in the open sessions with the Pope, raise specifically the concerns that the victims asked to be raised uh, with the Pope? Yes. One by one. one by Absolutely. Raised. The one thing that was consistently and strongly and clearly and painfully made uh, by bishop after bishop was with regard to the impact of abuse on, on the victims themselves, on their families, on the community in which they, were, in which they lived. And um, uh, I, I was, and I mean, it, it, it wasn't as if we were kind of trying to persuade people of something that they didn't believe. I think people there realize, and if they didn't, they realize now, how, how just the, the, impact, the impact of abuse on people, on their, on their, on their health, on their careers, on their relationships, and on their faith. So, I mean, that, I mean, that point was made loud and clear and, and, and very well understood, and uh, I think it was made consistently across the board. Why in the statement issued after the meeting with the Pope was there no, acknowledge, was there no acknowledgement of the complicity of the Catholic Church in covering up the incidents, covering up clerical child sex abuse, and no apology on that account. The, I suppose the first thing I would say is that responsibility uh, for the management of these cases in Ireland is in Ireland. It's, the, it's, uh, it's within the diocese and the religious congregations and so on. It, it's people here who were responsible for the management of, of those cases it was only, in fact, in, in, in 2001 that the Holy See made it clear because they felt that uh, perhaps bad judgments were being made and that was, that was a matter of public record at that stage. They, they wanted at that stage to be involved uh, so that they could make sure that, uh, that bishops had access to a wider or, so let's yeah, say, a, a dispassionate view. Yes, of course. So yes, 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 we know. But why wasn't there an acknowledgement in the statement about the Catholic Church's institutional cover-up of clerical child sex abuse. And why wasn't there an apology on that account? 
We were talking about what happened in Ireland. Uh, and yes, and uh, there was yeah. an apology. Yes. No, there was uh, there was an apology to do with the uh, the uh, the actual uh, abuse of children, but no apology about the cover up. The Irish bishops at their December meeting here uh, asked forgiveness for the uh, the way that they had uh, uh, mishandled this. Yeah. And there's nobody there's nobody question. I must just go back for a moment to the point that you asked Bishop uh, Christie about earlier and about the, the abuse and the, there is nobody disputing today that the way that the Catholic Church and its authorities handled this issue over a generation was a huge uh, problem. I mean, the, it has been said catastrophic, horrendous, you can put whatever kind of words the on error it. error of you know, judgment is all that the state well, could bring massive, itself to characterise it. Massive, that's, ma that's massively, no. massively that's misguided, massively wrong. Why don't they acknowledge the criminality of the complicity? There was a, it amounted to complicity in the sexual abuse of children. And why isn't there an acknowledgement of that in the statement, and why wasn't there an apology for that? Right. The press release, the press release at the end of that uh, meeting, is one relatively short statement. The post letter is still to come, and in any case, the Irish bishops have made clear their own views about their past, about how things were handled, and I think prob I mean, what we would like to stress more importantly is the work that we're doing today under the guidance of the national board. Ian Elliott and his colleagues to make sure that wherever children are involved in the life of the church in future, that they will be safe. Okay. And that's, and that's just, I, I want to ask a further question. I want to ask a further question. And it has to do. Yes, and we get, we get, we, and it has to do with a, a part of the statement. And it, ha it refers to a, an expression of hope that the meeting would help to unify the bishops. Why did the bishops need to be helped to be unified? Well, we don't want to be unified against anybody. We want to be unified in our commitment to doing yeah. what is absolutely right yes, for my now question and is, for the future. Why did the bishops need help to be unified? It clearly implies there was disunity among the bishops. Uh, I think that's, that that's the Holy Father's role to, to confer on his brothers in the faith in, in all sorts of ways. So it, it's very yeah. much yeah. Isn't there a clear Prince inference Prince in Prince that Prince statement Prince that there is disunity among Prince the Prince Irish Prince bishops? Prince Isn't Prince it Prince clear Prince inference? Prince. How can the Irish Episcopal Conference regain any moral authority until you meet the basic demands of the victims and survivors, namely the resignations of all bishops named in the Murphy report? How can you sit down with Bishop Brett Brennan at this meeting and retain any credibility. He's such a divisive figure. Why didn't you tell him that? Why didn't you support him? I think that's yeah. very, I think you have been very, Father M M Bishop Brennan is a scholar. Martin Brennan is a scholar. Wait a minute now, let me finish, please. He's a scholar, he's a holy man. He is a holy man and nothing, nothing has been said negative. In fact, any reference to him in the report has been positive. That might be described as the highlights of the press conference. Um, Patsy, it was disappointing. Well, Vincent, um, having been at many of these before, uh, it was a little livelier, I expect, than many others. Um, I found, uh, disappointing, I'm not quite sure, I found the comments of Bishop Jones quite extraordinary. Um, that uh, he, the, the, the tone of, of being under siege, uh, of the unjustified criticisms that he, he feels are coming in, in his and the church's direction. But the equation of an, an organized body, a corporate body like the church, with the family, for instance, or, 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 as, he, as he tried to push it across, I found utterly and completely bizarre. I mean, we know that individual families like that case last week, there was a common case that both the husband and wife abused children and both covered it up. But in the church, for instance in Dublin, in, in the Murphy report, they, they discovered that four archbishops, one after the other, systematically covered up what was going on in this archdiocese. These were men who weren't part of the problem themselves. They, were, they weren't involved in any of this activity, unlike that couple in Roscommon last week. They weren't caught into it. They were detached from it. They were objective from it, if you like. And they did it to use a, the, the, that, the Catholic definition of mortal sin with full knowledge and with full consent, and it was grievous harm. And he seems to have moved the goalposts in the whole matter, at least in his own head, I'm talking about Bishop Jones. It just, it doesn't, you can't compare 
the abuse in the family with the abuse uh, that this institution was found of has, having been responsible for in Dublin. What did you f uh, think of the press conference, Mary? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's extraordinary to hear a bishop ask why people are singling out the church um, in, in the context of asking questions about the cover-up of child abuse. When you look at who the moral arbiters are in society, who are, what is the organisation that we have allowed in Irish society um, and that have been um, to the fore in telling us what is right, what is wrong, what is morality, what is sin, what is virtue, um, and then we discover through a series of reports that they have behaved um, with the greatest hypocrisy uh, according to their own rules. And then bishops complain and wonder why they're being singled out and why it is we are asking these questions about them. It's, it's, it displays, what it displays, I think, is, a, is an amazing detachment from real life. I mean, these people are obviously so disconnected. They're so, they live in such a kind of a rarefied atmosphere. They haven't the slightest comprehension as to why it is people get exercised over this issue. Um, I mean, and it was, I was very struck by uh, the statement, you know, when the row broke in Ferns over uh, Bishop Brennan, who indeed who was there, who didn't really say very much, um, looking for contributions to compensate people, contributions from parishioners. There had been a redefinition almost of uh, what it was that they were involved in, in terms of cover, no mention of cover-up, no mention of negligence. It was mismanagement and our lack of resolve. And the and are really got me, um, and a lack of understanding. So, you know, this has now been uh, minimised, the actual culpability. I was interested to hear Bishop McAreevy. He, he expressed it as uh, massively misguided and massively wrong, which is a bit of an advance on and are lack of resolve. But, you know. In a statement after the Vatican meeting, they called it errors of judgment. It's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, what, 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 they, what they respond to is um, how the extent to which they're pushed by uh, what they perceive as, as public opinion. And they will only acknowledge um, you know, a little inch if they think mm. that they can't get away with it. I mean, this statement, um, and I was just looking at it there in, in, in the Irish Times, um, uh, this statement from Bishop Jones um, that uh, people didn't have a voice and that we have given them a voice. They have been given a voice. Victims have only been given a voice recently, as if this is some sort of gift that has come yeah. from the Catholic Church Vincent, to, to, to victims. It's, abso it's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary, but he, he appeared to take responsibility for giving victims a voice. Yeah. I mean, it, we all know that it wasn't the church that gave victims a voice. They took it themselves. There's an old saying about bishops that uh, once you become a bishop, you'll never be hungry and you'll never be told the truth. And I do believe, frankly, that in that this is an illustration the question is, will you, will men, you yourself tell the truth? Repeat that. The question is, surely, once you become a bishop, will you yourself tell the well, truth? That's another issue indeed. Clearly, these men either haven't had access, or still, I mean, they, they might, it's hard to believe at this stage that they don't have access to the full truth. We've had three massive reports and another one in train. Um, but they haven't, either they're allowing it to be interpreted for them in a particular fashion, but clearly they are in denial. And we've seen the, this, I mean, in statements from the likes of Bishop Dermot O'Mahony, the former auxiliary in Dublin, who was found particularly by the Murphy report to have mishandled, I think it was seven cases. And uh, he wrote this extraordinary letter to Archbishop Martin about he was being treated, how he had been treated by him, uh, how in these 50 years of priesthood he had never received any, a, a letter as harsh. But the man, uh, he was, this was after he was at a meeting at the priest of City West where effectively he argued the point the whole way against Murphy. We had an interview with the uh, former auxiliary, uh, sorry, the former chancellor of the Dublin Archdiocese, Alex Stenson, where effectively he turned the thing on its head. There is a massive denial still at op in operation here. And whereas after their winter meeting, the bishops did acknowledge fully, it seemed, and accept fully, it seemed, the Murphy Report's findings uh, and its recommendations, now they seem to have pull back again, they don't, they again don't, they don't, and again. They, they accept there's enough. indication that they pull back from uh, it's, the It's really limit. clear and I mean there's an enormous value in actually showing uh, the amount of the press conference that you showed tonight because very, we actually don't get to see that unless you know people are actually yeah. at the conference themselves. They accept nothing and they All acknowledge right. nothing we, and we, un we, unless they're actually <coughs> forced to. We're going to take a break and after the break we'll continue the discussion also preview tomorrow morning's newspapers. Join us then.
Welcome back. Uh, we're joined by Bill Tom. He is a consultant at Bowman Hospital, and he's going to talk to us a little later on in our preview of tomorrow morning's newspapers about the fiasco in another hospital, in the Tara Hospital, over the x-rays. But just to continue for a moment on the press conference at the bishops today. Uh, Patsy, one of the reasons that we were interested in the press conference was that we felt that since it was the first press conference the bishops ha were to have since the meeting with the Pope, and since the statement that was issued after the meeting with the Pope had been in press relations terms or public relations terms such a fiasco. We thought there would be a real big effort now to um, put a different face on it and that we'd have all the, uh, the big guns blazing uh, today and th there would be a full exposition, a full explanation as to what went on. And that's why I'd call it a disappointment that we had this very low-key affair abbreviated to, to uh, 25 minutes and then they ran off. Uh, ran off on us. Well, to compound the matter, Vincent, having been in other previous press conferences, um, it was, as you said earlier, I think, in your introduction to the programme, it was just two hours before the press conference took place that we were notified. Now, normally, you'd know uh, the day before, or maybe at the very latest, early in the morning of the day. And um, as you say, I had expected, as others would have, that Cardinal Brady and Archbishop Martin would both be there. Um, I, I spoke briefly to Archbishop Brady, Cardinal Brady yesterday. Um, he said he wouldn't comment, that he'd speak at the press conference tomorrow, that is today. Uh, and clearly that didn't happen. Archbishop Martin himself was missing from the press conference in Rome, where it was widely expected that he would have been there, as well as Cardinal Brady, because both of them went to Rome after Ryan, both of them went to Rome after Murphy, both of them really were the men responsible, as far as we understood, for the fact that the, all the bishops ended up going to Rome. So. Um, so far, there has been, again, a playing down, if anything, of, of their presentation of issues related to this matter. Possibly when the, the pastor letter comes, this much vaunted pastor letter, they may then decide to hold a press conference, the two of them, as the two leading figures in the Catholic yeah. Church in Ireland. The, but we don't the, know. The level of denial that we saw tonight, I think, is actually really serious. And it's yet another compelling argument for the state to extend the inquiry process nationwide to extend the Dublin process to every diocese in the country. And the reason for that is that those three men and every other bishop who was at that meeting, uh, they appoint boards of management of every, almost every primary school in the country. Uh, they have a veto over uh, the appointment of teachers, the employment of teachers in those schools. They uh, control the ethos within these schools. So almost every parent in the country who leaves their child off at the school gate, um, by, by extension, has, a dire has direct dealings with these individuals and these people, yeah. if they remain in such fundamental denial about the cover-up engaged in by the Catholic Church uh, of child abuse, it, it, there is a huge question of this, over the safety of children within that education system until and unless we extend that inquiry process throughout the country. Whereas I absolutely agree with Mary that it must be extended, particularly to some diocese like Raffaux, I'd have to say this, that um, the National Board for Safeguarding Children, their own watchdog, has done very good work. It is the, the body that exposed the malpractices in, in Cloyne Diocese, which has led, led to the extension of the remit of the Murphy Commission to Cloyne. And uh, I would have great confidence in Ian Elliott in this new audit that they're undertaking over the next two years. However, that's to do with the future, and the present and the future, we still really the need to know what we've done in the past. Many of, these, many of the people at that meeting have covered up abuse. We know this because well, we I'm know that there any of the three bishops no, we, no, uh, no, no, but we know we that there have been uh, numerous settlements made with victims of abuse in numerous dioceses uh, by current uh, sitting bishops. Yeah. Uh, and what we don't know is the extent and the depth yeah. of the cover-up that took place in these cases. Oh, okay. and it, it, we absolutely yeah. have to find out be, uh, because of the position that these men hold, not in church uh, uh, in, in terms of their authority within the church, but within secular society, okay. because we give moment. them power over All right. our society. Just another abused. public relations um, yeah. um, yes, fiasco, yeah, would that be too uh, uh, But it is more serious than that, that sort really of thing. Is, yeah. you know? All right. Let's uh, go to tomorrow morning's newspaper. We start with the front page of the Irish Times. It leads with pressure mounts on Tana board over x rays tobacco. Hospital also also failed to process GP referral letters. Over on the right, uh, Bishop says media unfair and unjust. That's Pat McGarry's uh, piece there. Uh, down at the bottom, Jihad Jane travelled to Ireland to meet suspects. In the Irish Sun, busted moments got these swooped in terror suspects. This is the dramatic moment when armed cops stormed the home of suspected Islamic uh, terrorists. Uh, I think this, that, that sort of that coverage is so prejudicial, I, I would have thought, um, uh, and 
well, I don't know. Um, anyway, the Irish Examiner, patients face anxious wait for results of X-ray, sorry, the Irish Examiner, patients wait, an face anxious wait for results of X-ray audit, Harney under fire as all hospitals to check scans, and then uh, life for killer at large, uh, that's uh, Oliver Hayes who's been escorted from the court uh, to serve a life sentence. At the bottom, HSE placed children with unapproved foster carers after ending the practice. God, it's extraordinary. Um, uh, the Irish Daily Star, Obama comes home. President will visit Ireland in June. And over on the left there, Republicans sued over drink drive car crash. Um, in the Irish Independent, managers ignored warnings over x-rays, pressure on Harney to step down, HSE orders probe into tobacco. And a photograph there of Nicholas Sarkozy and his wife, uh, Carlo Bruni, and Nicholas would never cheat, says Carlo, on a fair rumours. Uh, um, on the right there, big, big two banks hike interest rates on credit cards. Um, also there, Gormley tipped, tight-lipped about cabinet seat rotation. Um, and that's it. Uh, Bill, uh, you've been reading, the, you've had more time to read the papers than the rest of us have um, on this Tala uh, fiasco on the x-rays. Can you understand how that mistake happened? Well, all I can gather from all of this is that last, before last summer, the HICWA was told that there were approximately 4,000 unread x-rays last June. It then turned out that somebody else, and that they were clear them all by July. They then turned around in November and said that there were 400 problems, or 700 problems in November the 26th in the letter. And now in March, it turns out that there are 56,000 problems in relation to x-rays. So that's enormous incompetence, administrative incompetence, and medical incompetence, in my personal opinion. And I think that the board, somebody has to be held responsible in this country for something at some time. And I think the least that should happen is the board should go. And you might ask me reasonably, what is going on? Well, there are three to four hospitals that I know about, that I've been told about on inquiry on the way over here tonight that uh, do not report all x-rays for the simple reason that it's not really reasonable to do so. And I'll give you an example. Uh, repeat x-rays in fracture clinics where the surgeons are just looking to see how it got on in, a, in, a, in an operation or when the plaster has been put on. You don't need a radiologist to tell you that it's changed, whatever. Um, secondly, perioperative or intraoperative x-rays that are done when a surgeon is operating, they obviously wouldn't be reporting those later because they're only relevant on the spot right now. Now you could when the PAC system, that's picture archives retrieval systems, when they're introduced right around the country and they're going into Sligo and Limerick and Beaumont at the moment, when it becomes filmless and you can just squit, you know, squit, 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 like, like looking at pictures in your, on your, on your um, digital camera. When you get to that situation, then it's much easier to review these things, and you can actually do it remotely. And it's been re and remote X-ray reporting has been going on from Bangalore, uh, from, from California to Bangalore for years at this stage on a deal done, and it's much cheaper. Um, this is about governance, Vincent. This is about gagging clauses. This is about the whole business of reform in the health service. Reform is not synonymous with improvement. I want to point that out. People think that reform. Cowan says. The Minister for Health is uh, reforming the health service, and the implicit uh, statement in that is the innuendo is that it's going to improve. Well, if you introduce gagging clauses, if you threaten doctors who want to go public on anything, if you prevent them talking to the press, if you have hospital policies, which I know about because I've rejected it in writing, that actually say that you have to report to the, H to the chief executive before you say anything to any journalist about anything, and you can be threatened. If you have the Medical Council, on the other hand, that has a whistleblower's charter ri written into their latest ethical guide, which obviously goes in exactly the opposite direction to hospital policy, HSE policy, and the common contract policy, you have a recipe for nonsense, for cover-up, and for this sort of thing to go on. All right. And Vincent, to be quite honest, the board has got to go in Tala for, uh, for uh, lack of... Uh, governance. And the other thing that's very right. interesting Sorry, is that, just, just one second, yeah, Tom O'Dowd, to the GP who makes a point, he says that his GP referrals, because this is no really serious. We'll come back. Uh, uh, okay, we, Manson. We better go okay, to another break. Uh, okay. Join us in a moment. Uh, welcome back. Uh, 
Bill, I cut you off. There's apparently seven bags of unopened referral yeah, letters. There's two years worth of GP referral letters unopened, which, if true, it, this is a Tala hospital. A Tala hospital from which, GPs. Yeah. From GPs, and apparently Professor O'Dowd, the GP professor in Trinity, complained formally about this, and this is why all of this is tumbling out. Two years of unopened. Uh, That's of what it says. There's pictures here. That's sack, right. Sack, and the irony of all of this is that he wrote to the chairman of the board last April, and he. The letter was stamped in the, ma in the chief executive's office around that time. And when was it given to the, chief, the chairman of the board? Right now. So that, in fact, there's a serious governance problem in Tala Hospital. Heads should roll, but the previous chief executive has already rolled. So I think the board should go for not looking after how the administration was actually performing. There is no doubt. The board has to go. Iqua, and if the board doesn't thought, go, was Harley should go. Uh, Iqua was fairly tardy. In Iqua Wisconsin. was not. Iqua was given misinformation. What can Iqua do if somebody tells them a porky pie? It's as simple as that in writing. The, the numbers, as I already said when I was at, starting at the beginning, the numbers tumbled out hugely differently as the story came yeah. along. Uh, setting Iqua aside your Fine Gael allegiance, do you think Mary Harney should be fired? Uh, I think she should fall on her sword, yes. Uh, she should resign herself before she's fired, because it's quite clear. <laughs> she won't be fired. The Taoiseach Cowan no has. Way she'll be fired. I'm aware of that. The, if the, Taoiseach uh, Cowan the, Fianna 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 depends this on her vote, and if she's fired, she has no obligation to vote for Fianna Fáil government. And um, Patsy, you, you wanted to raise um, Vincent, an issue yeah, to do with. I see in the Examiner they have a, a piece in the front page about uh, Bishop Martin Drennan of Galway calling on his parishioners to engage in reparation for sex abuse. And in fact, the Irish Catholic has this story today. And they said that he's written to each parish in the connection with the reparation service in Galway Cathedral on Palm Sunday. And they are to bring a, a sprig of palm to place on the altar uh, to express the penitential mood of the day. And he says, we'll be asking God's forgiveness for crimes of physical, sexual and emotional abuse that have brought shame on all of us. And I really query that. How has it brought shame for a start on the people of, of, who would be in that congregation, the people of Galway? in this context. I mean, Bishop Drennan, I might understand it, by the way, too, it would be more appropriate where he, ho he hold such a service in South Dublin, where he was an auxiliary bishop for seven years. And there... If he uh, held the service in, in Maynooth, the magnificent church in Maynooth, while the other bishops... Were Absolutely. There. But, but why share out the blame among the innocent people yeah. of, the, of his congregations? I think it's that's It's just part of the denial, I it think, is, yeah. It's more of it. They're all... Everyone's to blame, but then... It's, it's, it's um, whereas the, there is an explanation, though, for what's happening. Um, which everybody would be very happy with because it means it's nobody's fault. This is in the Indo. Uh, it's in the front page and it says, Devil at work in Vatican, says the Holy See's chief exorcist. The growing clerical <laughs> sex abuse stuff. scandals in the Catholic Church are proof that the devil is at work inside the Vatican. So we now know it's not the Pope's fault, it's not the Bishop's fault, it's not priest's fault, it's the devil. But you know that some of the, the, these the priests who did abuse children, it. particularly in residential <laughs> institutions, as Michael O'Brien so vividly put it on question oh, and right. answers, they beat the kid because they blamed the child. The child was temptation. The devil was working to the child. All right, we've got to leave it there. That's it for now. For more tonight's program, log on to tv 3io Thanks to the bishops who took part in the program tonight and also to our panellists here in the studio. The weather's next. Must tonight. Good night. <laughs>